afternoon, and thank you for joining us. My name is Nicole Kading, and I'm the Director of Federal Press at the Tax Foundation. Uh, thanks for joining us for our latest Talking Tax event, Taxing Pass-Through Businesses. Uh, first, I want to thank Asian on Block for their sponsorship of this event and this entire event series. Um, it's been a great partnership over the last several months. For those of you in the audience, you can join the conversation as well on Twitter using the hashtag TalkingTax. Uh, I will have the honor here of introducing our esteemed panelists and then we'll jump right into this conversation, which I think will be quite lively given these panelists we have here today. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it's a tall order. <laughs> Who doesn't want to talk about back past the business on a Friday afternoon? Yeah. Um, first of all, the context here. We've talked a lot here in Washington DC for the last couple of years about how do we tax businesses. Past the business, of course, are the our LLCs, they're exports, they're sole proprietorships, they're partnerships. And they represent more than 90% of businesses here in the United States. They employ more than half of the private sector workers in almost every state. So getting the tax code right for these businesses is important. And it's a, worth a conversation that we needed to have and we will continue to have going forward. Of course, the biggest change in the last several years has been the introduction of Section 199A as part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So with that, I will introduce our panelists and then let them um, begin the conversation. Uh, first, we have Kyle Parlo, who is the Director of Quantitative Analysis here at the Tax Foundation. <laughs> Kyle oversees all of the Tax Foundation's modeling work, its research, uh, and writes on a variety of federal tax policy issues. His work has been cited in every major media outlet. Kyle is from Maine and holds an MPP from the Court School of Public Policy at Georgetown University. Brian Reardon is the president of the S Corp Association. Brian joined the S Corp Association after serving as special assistant to the president of the United States from 2003 to 2005. Prior to joining NEC in the White House, he served as the staff director and chief economist for the Senate Republican Policy Committee, as well as a number of other positions, including working at the, at the National Federation of Independent Businesses. Tony Nitti is a CPA and partner with Ruben Brown in Aspen, Colorado. Tony is an author of more than a dozen featured articles on the Tax Advisor, Taxes Magazine, and the Journal of Accountancy and Accounting Today. <clears throat> He's the author of a Forbes column called Taxes, the Nitty Gritty, and has also been cited in most of the major media outlets. And then finally, Amy Phillips is the director of the Tax Institute at h and Block. Amy leads in the company's industry and regulatory engagement strategy, along with leading the company's security summit initiatives. The security summit is a private part public partnership between the IRS, the tax industry, and many states focused on the prevention and detection of identity theft. He leads a team of centralized tax professionals who serve clients virtually throughout the country and is, the, is one of the lead spokesmen uh, to the media with h and so with that, we will begin our conversation. First, Kyle and Brian are going to have a conversation about pass-throughs, pass-through taxation, and one and in general, and then we'll switch to Tony and Amy. We'll have a bit more of a detailed conversation about the one and a regulatory process and what we've seen thus far in the season. Thanks, Nicole. Um, yeah, so I, I'm by training an economist, so that's how I'm coming at this, and you know, when I was tasked to be on this panel, I was actually very excited. This is a great topic, and it's one of, I think, one of the most important parts of tax reform, or part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, so it's a great opportunity to talk about it now. Uh, I'm going to make three main points here, or we're going to talk about three, three main issues. So first is you know, why we should care about tax for businesses and why we should think that they are important to the U.S. economy. Two, talk a little bit about why they were central to tax reform and why they became, it was, it was a big deal and important to address that, that in, in reform. And then lastly, a few comments about, you know, trying to answer the question briefly, you know, was Section 199 CAFE the right answer? 
Uh, so, you know, why are pass-through businesses important to the U.S. economy? Well, first, like, what is a pass-through business? That hasn't been stated yet, so I will, I will do the honors here. So, you know, under the U.S. tax code, there are several types of businesses that are not subject to the corporate income tax. Instead of, of a direct tax on the entity, the profits only earned by these pass-through incomes are passed through to their owners, and then the owners pay tax on their individual reforms at the ordinary income tax rate. And these are sole proprietorships, partnerships, S-corporations. And these businesses are a major part of the U.S. economy. We did a paper, uh, I think now two years ago, just highlighting um, the, the scale of these companies and the profits that they earn. So here are a few statistics that are important. So according to the U.S. Census 2014 data, so a little bit data, uh, dated, about 30.8 million business entities in the United States, and 28.3 million of them are passed through businesses. So the vast majority of business entities in the United States are pass-throughs. And not just on the entity side, but also on the, um, the economic side as well. If you count up all the workers in the United States, more than 50% of that employment is accounted for by employment at pass-through businesses, whether it's a self-employed individual as a sole prop or a very large partnership out in Tyson's Corner uh, employing a lot of accountants. It's about 50, a little more than 50% of employment in the U.S. is accounted by these types of businesses. And the importance of these businesses has grown significantly over time. So in 1980, about 60% of all business income is earned through C corporations. Well, today that's roughly flipped. About 60% of business profits are now earned through pass through businesses. And just looking at business forms over that time, more than 100% of the growth in the number of businesses in the United States is accounted for by pass through businesses. What this means is that pass throughs have increased in the number of the entities and corporations over that same time have actually declined. We actually have fewer traditional C corporations in the U.S. economy than we did, um, or at least at the time of this study. Um, I don't think it's changed too much yet, um, but we had fewer in 2014 than we did in 1980, which is pretty significant given the change in the size of the economy and the population. So what were the big issues for pass-through businesses in, in tax reform, and why were they, why were they central to the, to the issue? Well, one big issue, thinking back all the way to the camp, camp draft, was this idea that if you're going to do business tax reform, it should be this idea of lowering the tax rate and broadening the tax base. Um, economists like this because high statutory tax rates distort lots of behaviors, narrow tax bases, um, reduce average tax rates for taxpayers, and reduce the amount of revenue federal governments um, can raise. So a big issue here was, you know, how do you go about doing that? Well, a big issue arised with that was that if you lower the statutory tax rate for corporations and broaden the tax base, well, that base broadening impacts all businesses, where the pass-throughs and corporations, where the reduction in the statutory tax rate for corporations only benefits corporations. So if you just did that, you'd end up raising taxes on pass-through businesses with no change, if there was no change in statutory individual income tax rates. So this was a big challenge and one reason why lawmakers really needed to think through the dynamics of tax reform and how it impacts all businesses, not just traditional C corporations. And another big issue, and this I think Brian will talk about this, is, is this idea in the business community of neutrality between business forms in that pass-through businesses, they need to compete with corporations. They're in the same marketplace. They're doing a lot of the same stuff. So, you know, to the, to the extent that tax reform lowered the corporate tax rate without touching individual tax rate, that could change the balance. And um, Brian can talk more about this idea of rate parity or whether pass-through businesses and corporations are paying the same tax rate, so there isn't some sort of distortion there. Um, and I think, I don't want to give too much away, it's, it's a complicated issue, of course. <laughs> um, so, Given all of that, lawmakers, of course, came up with, eventually came up with Section 199 Cap A, 
So the question is, was section or is section 199 cap A the right answer? Uh, so you know, overall, I think any tax reform needs to address the taxation of all businesses. That seems pretty obvious because you know you want to make sure your code is as neutral as possible to any given economic activity and any given legal form. Um, but looking at 199 Cap A, um, I think it kind of fell short in terms of policy. Um, and you know, when I think about tax policy, or I think when anyone thinks about tax policy, they should be trying to evaluate it on you know, four, four criteria. Simplicity, administrability, neutrality, and efficiency. Um, and uh, these four ideas sort of encompass some of the trade-offs in tax policy. And you're trying to maximize along all of these these issues. So, but I think along these these lines, I think 199 Cap A kind of fell short. Um, so, I think first one complexity. You know, there's a lot of places in which the 199 Cap A is complex, um, and that certain how certain businesses are going to be hit harder with complexity than others. Um, and that's a concern. Administrability is another concern. Um, the deduction creates incentives uh, because certain income is getting a deduction and other income is not. It creates a challenge for tax administrators to define that income properly. Um, neutrality, I mean, just looking at 199 Cap A, there are concerns about neutrality that certain service businesses don't get the deduction at all, while other businesses get that. And that is, that is something that um, concerns me there. Um, and then, finally, efficiency, the economic effects of a policy. Um, now, it does, uh, the deduction itself does reduce marginal tax rates, but in some cases, that reduction in marginal tax rates isn't necessarily connected to what the goal of reform was, which was to increase investment in hiring. Um, that some businesses may be able to um, rearrange their affairs in ways to get the deduction, but that's not necessarily attached to a specific activity such as um, building a factory or, build, or um, installing a new machine. So, you know, overall, you know, past due businesses, very important, certainly important aspect of tax reform or any reform that you're going to do um, in the future. Um, but I think that, you know, as of now, you know, I think that 199 Cap A isn't, you know, perfectly structured or ideal. I think there are room, there's room for improvement there. Thank you, Kyle. Brian. Thanks, Nicole. So um, I, th I thought Kyle did a really good job of laying groundwork in terms of pastors, what they are, their importance to the economy. Um, I run the S Corp Association, and uh, we have a, a coalition of business groups, some of you are here, uh, uh, called the Main Street Employers Coalition. You can find their website under MainStreetEmployers.org. Um, and we've been working on these broader issues of tax reform, parity, pass-through taxation for about 10 years now. And, and the way I like to start off talking about it is, is if you started the tax code as a blank sheet of paper and we're going to design business taxation, you would tax businesses as S-Corps. S-Corps are the correct way to tax business income. You start with you know, income, you tax it once, you tax it when it's earned, and then there's no second layer of tax like there is with C-Corps, you're done. And what you're doing is creating a dynamic where you're going to tax all businesses the same way, and you're not going to have the distortionary effects that you have with the double tax. The challenge with the double tax is really threefold. One, the double tax drives up the cost of capital because you pay the C corp rate now, these days it's 21%. And then if you kick out dividends to taxable shareholders, you're going to have to kick that all the way up to 39.8%. That's a really high marginal rate, and it rises, drives up the cost of capital. It reduces the capital stock in the United States of America, and you need capital to have a, a strong economy. The second thing it does is it distorts behavior. Because you're creating a decision on the part of the C-suites, where they make money, they pay the 21% rate, and then they got to figure out what to do with the remainder, it distorts behavior. They don't do what they might not otherwise do if that tax wasn't present. So what you're doing is creating a distortion. The distortion affects you're making decisions based on the tax code, not on the business needs of the, of the entity. And therefore, you're going to reduce business uh, activity, you're going to reduce economic growth that way as well. And then the third thing it does, and this is sort of personal to me, is it discriminates between closely held businesses and public companies. Because public companies 
are subject to the double tax, but they have many, many more tools to get around the double tax and work around it than a closely held business does. So if I'm a public company and I have money, I made money, I paid my 21%, and now I'm trying to figure out, okay, what am I gonna do with that remaining money? I have tools so that I can reward my shareholders without actually paying out dividends and draining money from the, from the business. I can simply, you know, restore, you know, take the money and reinvest it. I can go and do share buybacks. I can do all sorts of different things where I'm not paying that second layer of tax. And if my shareholders want to get rewarded, well, they can just go out to the public markets and sell the stock. It doesn't cost much. I think Schwab's going to charge me about four ninety five to sell a bunch of stock right now. So there's very little transaction costs, and they can get rewarded, and it doesn't affect the C corp at all. If you're a closely held business, you don't have those options. One, there's no public markets to sell your stock. Two, if you want to reward your shareholders, you got to kick out dividends. And so you're going to be kicking out dividends, you're going to be draining money from the economy. And then the third thing is, particularly for S-Corps, you're kicking out dividends to folks who are taxable. They have to pay the full tax. C-Corps have access to these pools of capital that don't pay the full tax. You've got pension funds, you've got sovereign wealth funds, you've got 401ks. There's all sorts of shareholders in C-Corps that don't pay that full rate. So they have access to pools of capital that closely held businesses just don't have. So if you're gonna force people into the double corporate tax, you're disadvantaging family businesses, local businesses, the businesses that make up the economy in so many communities around the country. So that, that's kind of our premise in terms of the need for parity and the importance of getting the tax policy right for pastors. Uh, I think the fundamental question that you have to ask yourself is, you know, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, how did it do? And, have a little handout. If you go to the second slide of the handout, this is my best approximation of kind of illustrating just how complicated it is. And if you go to the C-Corp one, you can see the minimum corporate rate under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is 21%. That's a corporation where they're not kicking out dividends, they're not paying that second layer of tax. Think Berkshire Hathaway, right? Warren Buffett has run Berkshire Hathaway for a million years. He's never paid a dividend to any shareholder, and he's taken all of his stock and he's given it to the Gates Foundation. So Berkshire Hathaway, at least the shares that Warren owned, they're never gonna pay that second layer of tax. Their effective top rate is 21%. Now, on the other hand, if you have a closely held business where they're kicking out all of their earnings, after-tax earnings, and they're doing so to people who pay taxes, the full report, then they're gonna be paying 39.8. Most C-Corps fall somewhere in the middle. The more tax advantage shareholders you have, the lower the rate. The more you retain your earnings and you don't kick them out as dividends or you don't do share buybacks, the lower the rate. Um, so that's kind of the range. It goes from 21% to 39.8%. For S-Corps and pass-throughs, um, you start with a 37% rate. And then if you get the full deduction, the 20% deduction on all your business income, then the top rate you're going to pay is 296 now, there's lots of reasons why businesses, and Nick and, and Andy are going to tell us all the reasons why a lot of businesses are not going to get that full 20% deduction. But the bottom line is, if you do as good as you can under the Tax Cuts, Cuts and Jobs Act, you're going to be paying 29.6%. Now, the, there's all sorts of variations here. If you're in the wrong industry, if you have out, uh, income that comes from overseas, if you have passive shareholders, uh, if you don't have enough employment, if you don't have enough capital, then that rate's going to go up, and the top rate for the businesses that do really well, they don't get the deduction, they lose salt, they're in a high-tax salt state, they're going to be paying well over 40%. So those are the ranges. So when somebody says, well, how'd you guys do under tax reform? The simple and honest answer is, well, it depends. It depends on all these different things. So to provide a little clarity, if you go to slide three, we asked EY last year, you know, so cut through all the, all, all the variables and give us a sense of, you know, how, how did we do here? And what they did was for the C-Corp, you have to think of this as a benchmark. This is the average C-Corp in the United States of America, average profile of shareholders, average dividend payout policy, it's average. And the average C-Corp in the United States pays a top marginal rate of 30.6% under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. If you're an S-Corp or a pass-through and you get the full deduction, you do as well as you possibly can, you're very close, it's 31.9%. It's close enough for us, it's parity, we'll take that. But the problem is, and I think you're gonna hear you know, later on in this uh, discussion, that there are lots of reasons why companies in the pass-through world aren't gonna get that bottom rate. They're gonna pay a little bit more. 
And one of the big questions that I get all the time is, well, if it's so bad, why don't you just convert to C? Well, this gray line up here, that's what happens if you're closely held S corp and you convert to C, you're still gonna pay a higher rate because you do have to kick out dividends and those dividends are gonna be taxed at the full rate. So the bottom line is that if ARC members get the deduction that they were promised, and it's a robust deduction and they're able to get it on all or much of their income, then they're going to get parity with the C-Corps or something close to it. If they don't, then they're going to have to either convert to pay a higher rate or they're going to have to pay a higher rate as, as, as a pass-through. This little dotted line over here on the right, that's what happens in 2026 when the deduction goes away. Then the effective rate for pass-throughs, and these are the top rates we're talking about here, go all the way up to 40%. Uh, that's something we're trying to avoid. Um, slide four here. This is my simple-minded effort to make sense of the 199 cap A deduction. Um, somebody yesterday described it as the 50 shades of gray chart. Um, you know, I'll let these guys go through it, but the bottom line is it's pretty complicated stuff. And as, as our friend Kyle mentioned, you get all sorts of different outcomes based on the profile of your business. There's not a whole lot of uh, a parity going on within businesses and different industries, et cetera. And the last thing I just want to bring up is this idea that, you know, all those complexities aside, the 199 cap A goes away in 2026. And that's going to have not just a significant effect on pass-through businesses, but it's going to hurt the economy as well. And this is a really nice study that economists Barrow and Furman did last year. You can see the little circled area. If Congress doesn't make all these provisions permanent, and in this case we're talking really about expensing the 199 cap A, then you're going to see that the, the, the economic growth benefits of the bill are significantly less than if they make them permanent, particularly in the pass-through struck side. You can see that under the current law, once the pass-through deduction goes away, taxes actually go up on pass-throughs and they're going to reduce the amount of economic growth you're getting from the tax reform. If you make it permanent, you can see that you get a robust result in the right direction and the positive direction. So that's where we're at. Um, do we achieve parity? Yes, in some cases we did. In some cases we didn't. It's remarkably complex. And then the big problem is it goes away. So that's what we're going to be focused on. In the future, we're going to try to make it as robust as possible, to make it as simple as possible, and make it permanent. Um, and with that, Oh, thanks, Nicole. Great, thank you, Brian. Uh, Tony. Thanks, Nicole. So, Kyle and Brian have done a great job explaining you know, why 199 Cafe is here. What we're going to do now is talk a little bit about how it works. And truth be told, right, probably have an easier task summarizing the Old Testament in 10 minutes than 199 Cafe, but we're going to give it a whirl here, okay? So, the way they're going to try to achieve this parity is starting in 2018, owners of sole proprietorships, S-corps, partnerships, trust estates, what we call pass-through businesses. In its simplest form, they're gonna be able to deduct 20% of what's called qualified business income, right, generated by the trader business. And therein kind of lies the first hurdle we have to get over, okay? And that hurdle is before you can take this 20% deduction, right, the business that you're engaged in has to rise to the level of what the tax law deems a trader business. And strange as this sounds, right, nowhere in the code and regulations does it define a trader business. Now, the Supreme Court has told us that to be a business, right, an activity can't be sporadic amusement or a hobby, right? It's got to be, one, entered into for profit, and two, be engaged in with continuity and regularity. And so for most of your ongoing you know, ventures, this is going to be a pretty easy standard to meet, right? Where it creates problems is with rental properties. A hundred years of case law hasn't definitively answered when and how a rental activity rises to the level of a trader business, and it's obviously very important because owners of profitable rental properties are going to want to take a deduction of 20% of their income, but before they can, it's got to be a trader business. And so to fill in that void, right, at the same time final regulations were issued under 199 Cap A in January, the IRS also published Notice 2019-7. And that notice provides a safe harbor. And that safe harbor allows the owners of certain rental properties, right, to basically look at their rental property or they can, in limited circumstances, kind of group some rental properties together and say, hey, if during the year it required kind of 250 hours of rental services to make this property go, 
then I satisfy the safe harbor and my rental is a trade or business. Rental services are things like negotiating leases and you know, double checking applications and doing maintenance and repairs. And it doesn't have to be services provided by the owner. It could be anybody you know, at the business level, owner, employee, independent contractor. But you get to this 250 hours, voila, your rental is a trade or business, you can take the deduction. That's good news for some, but not all, because certain owners of rental property cannot use the safe harbor. The most damaging would be anybody that rents property on what's called a triple net basis, meaning the tenant is on the hook for the real estate taxes, the maintenance costs, and the insurance costs. And the reason I say that's problematic is because, at least in my experience, right, there's kind of an inverse relationship. The, the bigger my clients' rental activities get, the more profitable they are, the more they've kind of cornered their local market, and the more likely they are to actually be renting on a triple net basis. And so these taxpayers can't use the safe harbor. They've got to find another position to say that their rentals rise to the level of a trade or business, and the limited authority that's outstanding right now is not particularly favorable. Now, the regulations do give us kind of one bailout where rentals will default to being a trader business, and that's in the case of a self-rental, which is very common, where say you um, conduct, you know, you own a hardware store, which is obviously a trader business, but you obviously need a building to run the store out of, you have a separate LLC that you rent to the, you know, the business, that's what we call self-rental. Uh, under the final regulations, that type of self-rental to a pass-through business uh, will automatically be considered a trader business, even if it's a triple net lease or whatever it may be. But aside from that, all rental activities have to go through this dance of, can we use the safe harbor, or if not, do we take some other position that we're a trader business before they can get the 20% deduction, okay? So once we've decided that we are, in fact, a trader business, then we come to the most critical juncture in 199 Cap A. And if you remember nothing else I say up here today, just remember this, okay? There is a noted line of demarcation in dealing with 199 Cap A. And on one side of the line, it's very, very simple. And the other side of the line, it's very, very complicated, and there's virtually nothing in between. And that line of demarcation is the business owner's taxable income. Okay, so not their income from the business, but their total taxable income on Form 1040. After all items of income, after virtually all deductions, what is their taxable income? And if that number is less than $315,000 if the taxpayer marries filing jointly, or less than $157,500 if they don't, right, take a deep breath, because 199 Cap A is a piece of cake. Effectively, the owner gets to deduct 20% of their uh, qualified business income from the business, um, subject to an overall limitation based on taxable income that Andy's gonna actually touch on uh, when he talks. And so at those lower levels of income, so many of the complexities just don't matter. And I see people make kind of mistakes with this all the time, but you know, Kyle referenced certain businesses don't get the deduction. Well, when your income is below those thresholds I mentioned, 315 if married, 157.5 if not, we don't care what kind of business you're in. You can be a lawyer, you can be a doctor, you can be an actor, you can be an athlete, you get the deduction. Also at those lower levels of income, some of these limitations we're gonna talk about based on W-2 wages paid by or property held by the business, they don't matter either. It's just 20% of qualified business income. So the only thing you really need to know is what's qualified business income. And all for our purposes today, I would define it as, is think about the ordinary operating income the business was designed to generate. So if you have a dental practice, right, um, and you're under the threshold, right, it's the income that you get from cleaning teeth and filling cavities. If you have some extra cash and you invest it and you generate interest or dividends or capital gains, that type of one-off investment income is not eligible for the 20% deduction, okay? So if you're below the threshold, it's a piece of cake. All the businesses are good to go. There's no limitations based on W-2 or property basis. You take 20% of qualified business income, apply an overall limit based on taxable income, and go on about your day. Now, if you are above the threshold, and there's actually kind of a phase-out range, so if your taxable income, if we want to deal in absolutes, uh, is greater than $415,000 if you're married filing jointly, $207,500 if you're not, now we get a bunch of complexities. And the first complexity is, as Kyle and Brian both alluded to, owners of certain businesses are shut out of the deduction, right? And what we're looking at here is 
kind of personal service businesses where, where all the income is generated from someone's efforts rather than from capital investment. And so it's defined as um, anybody who's engaged in the field of health or law or accounting or actuarial science or performing arts, consulting, athletics, financial services, brokerage, and then some reputation-based income like endorsement income or uh, appearance fees. And then they tack on for good measure investment management uh, or trading and dealing in securities, partnership interests, or commodities. So you can see what they're going for there, right? Personal service type businesses. Strangely enough, they pulled out of those definitions pre-existing uh, architecture and engineering. So again, we're creating some winners and losers. But uh, if you're in one of these businesses and your income's above the threshold, you have an issue. Now, the first thing that jumps out at you is these fields sound, sound kind of broad. What does it mean to be in the field of health, for example? Well, the final regulations really did a pretty darn good job of going field by field and saying, here's who's in, here's who's out. So for example, the field of health, they tell us you're a doctor, you're a veterinarian, you're a physical therapist, you're in the field of health, that's bad news. But you're a personal trainer or you own a health club, you're not in the field of health, so that's good news, okay? And they've done that field by field, but the point is we're never gonna just know how every business fits within these right fields. I mean, take the field of health, for example. Try as they might, it's very difficult for the IRS to address something as common as an assisted living facility, or what we call skilled nursing facilities, where you, know, you provide residence for uh, elderly people, but you also have nurses on staff that do some therapy work. Well, is that a field of health or not? And it's too fact specific to always just kind of say. And so we're gonna have to kind of see how this goes over a period of time, okay? But I do think the regulations address those fields in a way that narrows it far more than it might sound, okay? So you've got to, again, determine if you're in one of these fields. If you are, your income's too high, you're shut out of the deduction. Um, this furthering of the definition of each of these fields would be great if every business were black or white, right? If it's either one of these bad fields or it's not. But the reality is a lot of businesses do a little bit of both. Right? Say you sell licensed software, but you also provide some consulting services. Sell software is good, consulting is bad. Uh, again, say you're one of these assisted living facilities, providing the residence is fine, but the nursing right, services is bad. Or you're a bank, bank somehow is not in the field of financial services, um, but a bank is okay, but selling securities is bad. So how much of that bad activity is too much? Well, the final regulations give us a de minimis rule. And basically what it says is as long as your bad revenue, so from selling commodities or doing consulting or the nursing services, is less than 10% of your total uh, revenue, you're gonna be okay, you just ignore it. That's if your total revenue is under 25 million. If it's over 25 million, now you have to keep that bad revenue um, under 5% of total. So you can see that some businesses are gonna have their work cut out for them trying to either spin out bad businesses or keep the revenue under the threshold or under the final regulations, they allow you to argue that you actually have two separate and distinct businesses, but that's a nebulous standard in its own right, okay? So, gotta carve out the businesses that are bad and then once we're left with the businesses that are good, if our taxable income is over these thresholds, right, 415,000 if you're married filing jointly, 2075 if you're not, the deduction is limited, right, and the limit Again, they create new terms of art, but it is the greater of two amounts. 50% of the taxpayer's share of the W-2 wages paid by the business, or alternatively, 25% of those same wages plus 2.5% of the taxpayer's share of basis of property. And in particular, that, that new basis of property term of art is very complicated, right? What's in, what's not, uh, how long we get to count it. But the purpose for that rule is obvious. It's meant to help right, landlords, owners of rental property, because rental properties generally don't pay a whole bunch of W-2 wages, but they do have a lot of property with a lot of basis. So if you're above the threshold, you isolate your good businesses, and again, the general rule is we have to apply this limitation on a business-by-business -business basis. And that would have been woefully inefficient because nobody really saw 199 cap A coming in its current form. So people haven't carefully structured their businesses over the last few years to make sure each business had the proper mix of qualified business income and wages and property basis to maximize their deduction. And so fortunately, the final regulations provide two bailouts. Number one, 
If you're an individual and you own several businesses, as long as certain requirements are met, you can aggregate those businesses together. And if you do, you compute the deduction based on the aggregate amount of your income, 20% of that, subject to the aggregate amount of your wages and your property basis. So it creates a simplified but oftentimes more efficient deduction. And then new under the final regulations as compared to the proposed regulations, a pass-through business itself, if it conducts multiple businesses, can elect to aggregate those businesses. So now at least it's passing out to its owners only one amount of qualified business income, wages, and property, and not five or six or eight or however many businesses it owns an interest in. So you know that obviously creates some simplicity too. And so um, once you've kind of figured out, are you aggregating, not aggregating, you have to apply these W-2 and property-based limitations, and boom, you do the math and you come up with your deduction. And so you can see what I mean about when you're above the threshold, things take a turn towards complex pretty quick. Number one, are you in a bad business? Kick those out. Number two, the business is left behind. Do we aggregate, not aggregate? Right, what happens there? Um, three, if we don't aggregate everything, there's kind of a nuanced netting rule of losses against income in the regulations. But then four, once we finally figured out our qualified business income, whether on a separate or aggregate basis, it is subject to limitation based on wages paid by or property held by the business. After all that, we still have this overall limitation based on taxable income that we have to apply, and then mercifully, you're done. Okay, and so, as Brian said, when we really put this into practice, right, a lot of business owners are gonna get shut out of this deduction because they're in a bad business where the deduction is gonna be limited. And so, we may see, I mean, some people do anticipate kind of a sea change where tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of taxpayers over the next few years that are passed through entities could jump ship and become C corporations. And that's kind of exactly what Congress was trying to prevent by enacting 199 Cap A. But I don't think we'll really know how that plays out until we see how the deduction plays out in practice, which is perfect segue into Andy's conversation. Thank you, Tony. Um, yeah, super interesting to kind of get the perspective and expertise of, of the, uh, the guys going before me. And, and Tony, that's the best sub 10 minute overview of 199 <laughs> I have ever heard. And your he recall of the specified service. He did it without notes. He did, he did I know. He's got some bottles over here that his water was over. So I, I'm just woefully intimidated as we start. So luckily, I'm really here to just, what I'm going to do today is, is so I do work for HR Block, and I'm going to try to provide you with a perspective of how this kind of, these new rules are landing with individual and small business taxpayers and what these changes are kind of, what they mean to them. So they talked a little bit about there's some planning opportunities that you may be able to find to, uh, you know, increase or, or just a qualified baseline for the deduction. But there's a large portion of Americans that either cannot or choose not to participate in tax planning activities. So for those folks, first time they really feel the impact of meaningful tax changes is when they file that first tax return. Almost all of the tax reform provisions have gone into effect for 2018, which means we're really seeing a lot of the impacts now with our clients, um, kind of how these changes are manifesting on their bottom line of their tax returns. Um, to kind of expectation set a little bit, you know, we are we are a little over a month into tax season. We've got a lot of really good learnings. We we understand kind of client impact, but there is still a lot of time left in tax season. I'll talk about kind of impacted clients and kind of segments that I've made up for purposes of these comments. But there is a subset of taxpayers, those that are higher income, high complexity, that really haven't started filing their tax returns yet. And so for those folks who file usually towards the back half of tax season, for a large number of them, they file through you know, the extension season, which goes to October 15th. So this story is gonna to continue to evolve of how is this impacting taxpayers when they go to file their tax returns. So with that, I'll go ahead and uh, you know, just tee up a little bit of the three segments of taxpayers that I'll kind of, you know, how I'm gonna walk through this. The first group are taxpayers who file in the early season. They have you know, generally low to basic complexity returns then they're generally low to moderate income. They are also folks that may be self-employed. They're not, they may not have a business entity, but if you think of like an independent contractor or a, uh, you know, a freelancer, those folks qualify for this provision too, if they have a trade or business. And so that's the first group we'll talk about. And if you think about your know, Uber driver that uh, maybe took you here today, or uh, construction contractors, or again, freelancers, you know, there's, there's a big economy out there for that. And so that's one group we'll talk about. 
the next group we'll kind of dive into is uh, you know, these folks have slightly more complicated returns. They may, in fact, have an S corporation or a partnership, um, and their income really you know, runs the sphere of low to, to higher income taxpayers. So with those folks, there, you know, their bottom line you know, kind of fluctuates between they may have a refund or they may have a balance due, but they have a little more complicated scenarios. And then we'll wrap up with just kind of some early observations of what we're seeing with those more complex higher income filers. So just kind of starting with early season filers, that these are folks that participate in little to no tax planning. Um, so for a lot of those folks coming in, they first learned about this new provision when they visited our tax office or used our DIY program to prepare their return. So for those folks that, uh, you know, that are just learning about it, they're thrilled they get the deduction, right? Like, oh, who wouldn't be? It's, it's more money in my pocket, great. But for a lot of those folks, and, and Tony, I'm gonna, I'm gonna simplify this for sake of time, so uh, this is a technical simplification of how this works. But basically, what this 199A is, it's a deduction, right? So what that means is it's just reducing the amount of income you have that's subject to federal income tax. If you were already a lower income taxpayer, and because of the increased standard deduction, or, or you know, that, that would be one reason, you already have little to no taxable income. The benefit of this provision is fairly limited, even though you otherwise meet all of the eligibility requirements. So we're finding a lot of folks may qualify for the benefit, but the actual deduction is, is fairly small on their bottom line. Um, you know, some, uh, for those that are, that are eligible, I think that kind of ties up you know, how, how it applies to them. And then a common question we were really getting last year, this was before IRS started to kick out some guidance, um, and, and frankly, there was some content out there on this that may have been a little misleading, but folks were thinking, okay, well, you know, I'm an employee. It seems like if I just flip to independent contractor, right, I now get to take a 20% haircut on my income. It seems very simple, except one, there's already existing rules, you know, a set of tests on whether you're an employee versus an independent contractor. And so with those existing rules already in place, really just the IRS had to double down and, and remind everyone, no, there are rules you don't willy-nilly get to choose. Um, not to mention, take your tax hat off, put on your hat of every other consideration. There are other reasons why those folks might find it more beneficial to be an employee, like benefits and the like. But IRS was good to nip that one in the bud pretty quickly. Um, through some administrative guidance, I believe, before the regs even came out. And so that confusion was wiped away uh, early. So the next group we'll kind of talk about is that second group of taxpayers. And what, you know, there's a lot to unpack with these folks. I'm just, you know, for the sake of time, focus on a couple items in rental property owners. I think Tony did a great job of laying out how that works. So h and Block, we have a tremendous amount of clients that are residential rental property owners. You think I've got a rental house, I've got a duplex, something like that. For those folks who have one, two residential rentals, they, um, you think of just in pure terms of economic outlay, how much money am I paying out during the year versus how much rent am I taking in, they have a gain. But from a tax perspective, you think about they get depreciation deductions, which can be pretty sizable, mortgage interest, all the costs of being a landlord, they're actually running a loss for tax purposes. And just for a whole host of reasons, Having a, a, a 199 trader business that's running at a loss is not necessarily, it's never a good thing, right? It's, uh, it, it's only gonna, you know, for instance, if you have another business that is profitable, it may ultimately reduce the amount of your 199A deduction. So there's some level setting with taxpayers about, well, hey, let's make sure you have a, a gain first, but either way, we've still gotta analyze, is it a trader business? So even for those folks that have a gain or those that have a loss, because you still go through the analysis of, well, are you a trader business? Because bottom line, even if you have a loss, we need to make that determination. And uh, you know, there's a, so there's a lot of questions there about the level of activity required. A safe harbor came out with the final regs and an attached notice that provided some clarity and, and provided kind of a 250-hour threshold. So a lot of the questions we're getting now are like, you know, what qualifies for that 250 hours you need to put into this rental property, these rental properties each year? And some things you think like, oh, that would probably qualify, like window time, oh, I'm driving to my rental property. It doesn't. And so that's kind of a shock. But what's different in the context of 199A than how it applies in other kind of rental property situations is the, uh, you know, how, how uh, you know, services provided by agents are, uh, are treated. So in, in the 199A world, if you have an agent like someone that's doing maintenance on the property or cutting the grass, you may actually get to count their hours for purposes of the 199A safe harbor. So that, that's certainly a big benefit. And uh, 
you know, taxpayers then, the next step for them is, okay, you need to begin tracking your hours, and if you have a, you know, if you have an agency or someone that's handling the rental property for you, make sure you're working with any service providers that along with that invoice they send you, they're also tracking the number of hours they spent and the activity they did, because there's, there's a, you know, kind of an easier threshold this year for record keeping, but starting next year, the threat, you know, there is a contemporaneous, meaning real time as you're, as you're kind of doing these hours, you need to be uh, you know, tracking contemporaneous records of what you're doing and why. And so that'll change a little bit of taxpayer behavior. Um, a couple other ones I'll just touch on with this group are, uh, you know, the specified service business. There's a lot of questions there. You know, he, he, I think Tony did a great job of pointing out some of them. There are a lot of consultants in the world, and consultants is listed as a specified trade or business. Um, and there's a, there's a decent definition there, so folks want to understand, am I on the good side of the fence or am I on the wrong side of the fence? And so a lot of questions about specified businesses and whether, you know, they get the, again, it's another situation where there was maybe some confusion around there. If you're a specified business, some folks were under the impression that you didn't get the deduction at all. And basically there, there was some content out there really aimed at freelancers that helped perpetuate that misconception. So we have to help clear up that no, actually, if you're under these income thresholds, it really doesn't matter. And you know, the IRS has, has talked about this quite a bit. Between, I think, I think the numbers is 95% of taxpayers are gonna fall under those thresholds. And we serve a ton of those taxpayers. So even if you are a specified business, for them, it's, uh, it's not as impactful to their bottom line. And then, you know, one last piece I'll touch on with, with this group is the questions are really starting to pop up around K-1s. So what a K-1 is, if you're a, you know, a shareholder in an S-Corp or a partner in a partnership or beneficiary of like a trust, a K-1 is what that, that entity is gonna issue to you to uh, let you know your share of income and expenses from that entity. And so with those K-1s, there's been some new entries created for 199A. And so for those recipients, particularly, you know, we have, we have a DIY product, we have several DIY products, and we answer tax questions for our clients. For those folks, they, you know, some of their questions are as basic as what is this and what do I do with it? Um, and then on the other side, you know, we support a lot of small businesses where we actually create and issue the K-1s. And there's still some areas of uncertainty around, you know, what, how do I, you know, calculate this particular item, like qualified business income? There's a couple open questions on how I do that on the K-1. So a lot of questions coming in on those as well. And then I'll kind of wrap up with the final group, which is, uh, you know, it is still a little bit early for these folks coming in. They're not really coming in to prepare their tax returns yet, those higher complexity folks. A lot of them don't have all the documents, frankly, they need yet to prepare their tax returns. But the entities are dropping off their financials so we can begin the entity return and begin creating those K-1s. And some of their early questions are around eligibility. If they fall under the threshold, it's a, it's a little bit easier to answer in a vacuum. If they are above the threshold, particularly if, they have multi, if they're an entrepreneur that have multiple business interests, trying to give them a ballpark guesstimate of whether they qualify or not, how much you know, it's gonna look, is very difficult and is a bit of a fool's errand. So instead, we have to preach patience and let them know, you know, kind of, we're gonna, we'll look into this, we'll you know, put together your return and get back with you on that. And so um, I'll wrap up with one more kind of common question we're, we're seeing, uh, which these guys alluded to and, and talked about quite a bit. And these are true small business taxpayers coming in saying, hey, should I just convert to a C Corp? You know, I get a, it seems like I just get a flat 21% tax rate. We could spend all day on the considerations there. But I think, you know, Brian did a great job of pointing out Particularly if, you, if you're not a taxpayer that can just retain earnings in a C Corp, if you need to pull the money out because you need it for living expenses or whatever, you know, ultimately you may find that your tax rate is actually more beneficial staying as a pass-through entity. Not to, mention, not to mention that there are just, you, know, you always have to think when you're doing choice of entity planning with your tax hat, of course, I'm a tax guy. So I love that, but you also have to think with your business hat, and there are a lot of other considerations for these folks of why they chose the vehicle that they're in in the first place. And a lot of times when you look at the picture as a whole, it really doesn't make sense to convert. And so for, for those folks, it's kind of preaching, uh, you know, knee-jerk reaction isn't the way to go, and talking with your tax advisor isn't the only person you should be talking to before you make a choice of entity conversion. So with that, I, I hope I gave you some of the high notes of how this is kind of landing with taxpayers and some of the questions they're having. So with that, I'll go ahead and wrap up and kick it back over to Nicole. Thank you, Andy. Um, so with that, we'd love to take a few audience questions. 
Um, and of course, uh, please make sure that your question actually ends with a question. <laughs> <laughs> and because of the question. Um, I'll take moderator's discretion for the first one. Um, but very briefly, I would love to hear from each one of you. If you could make one change, what would it be? Yeah. I'll start. Well, I was prepared to talk more about different changes because I, I think that you know there are different questions here about you know whether we actually want one in the United Cafe. But I'll leave that aside. I think if I were to make one change, I think I would align one ninety nine Cafe more with capital investments, meaning that the benefit of that of the deduction is aligned more with the actual activity you're trying to encourage. Um, we wrote a paper earlier highlighting how we might do this, but you know the benefit is twofold here of aligning these incentives. One is you actually get more economic growth, that you're actually aligning it towards giving a benefit to the investment rather than giving a benefit that kind of goes to investment but also may go to a little bit of tax planning and labor income at the same time, meaning it's slightly less efficient than it otherwise would have been. But the second benefit is, is actually in this specific proposal where you limit the deduction specifically to investment, is that you can actually expand 199 Cap A to all businesses. It doesn't just have to be outside of the specified service businesses. Because I think it's it's just not simply true that you know just because it's a nursing service, it's not it doesn't have some sort of capital investment or some sort of opportunity to hire or create jobs. So discriminating against that sort of industry is bad. But at the same time, if you limit it to you know, certain investments, whether you're buying a computer, or you're buying a building, or something like that for your business, that would be accounted for, and you'd get that benefit even though you were in that industry. Michael? Sure. So to answer Kyle's question, yes, we want 199 Cap A. We just want a better 199 Cap A. Um, I, th I, think the, I think Kyle touched on one of the frustrations I have with it, which is the exclusion of different industries. Um, it's remarkably difficult, as our friends here have, have, have articulated, how you go about differentiating industries. We ran into this back in 2004 when we created the, the first 199. This was the manufacturing deduction. And I remember the ridiculous conversation about, you know, well, what's manufacturing? If, if I go into a hamburger joint and I buy a hamburger and they put it in a box and I walk out with it, that's production. And therefore, I, you know, you get the deduction, right? But if I get the hamburger, then I sit down at a table and I actually eat the hamburger on the premises, that's a service and you don't get the deduction for that. This is the kind of the, the Rube Goldberg world we're in right now. Um, I would eliminate that. I would eliminate the income thresholds. I hate income thresholds. They just provide needless complexity to the tax code. And then I would create some you know, guardrails that, um, like, to Kyle's point, focus on investment and, and, and hiring people. I think that you know, regardless of what industry you're in or regardless of how big you are, if you're actually creating employment, then you probably deserve something like 199 Cap A. Uh, for purely selfish reasons, I'd remove accounting from the list of specified services. <laughs> but once I was done with that, um, you know, I would absolutely love to have more certainty in the realm of rental properties. Right? When I, I wrote a, the letter in response to the proposed regulations, my first order of business and a lot of other commenters' first order of business was just give us some certainty, even if it's not great certainty. Make all rental properties de facto businesses, um, or at the very least, if someone's a real estate professional, if they truly ply their trade day in and day out in the real estate world, make all their rentals activities you know, de facto trades or businesses for a couple reasons. Number one, Right now, at least in theory, right, it seems like you have the ability to kind of cherry pick. And rentals with income, you're going to want to argue they're a trader business, so you get 20% deduction. But your rentals that are kicking off losses, maybe this one doesn't rise to the level of a business, and so it doesn't reduce my income from other sources. Um, and then, um, you know, a real life situation is if you have a client that owns 20 commercial buildings through 20 separate LLCs, and they're all being rented on a triple net basis, right now the fact pattern doesn't look great even though when you look at what that taxpayer does in a global perspective, how hard they work managing all those properties and the multiple tenants and the tenants are changing over every couple of years, 
clearly it would appear that they are in a trader business, but they can't use the safe harbor, and the very limited case in administrative ruling history is not favorable to them. So I really wish they had just kind of gone with the AICPA's recommendation, which was just make every rental activity, income loss, whatever, make them all trades or businesses so that everyone's in the same boat. But here we are. So I'll, I'll, for the most part, really just defer to my co-panelists here on, on you know, changes that should be made, what's right and what's wrong. But I will latch on a little bit to one thing that Tony said, which is, um, you know, not, not that the rules should go one way or the other, but just for taxpayers, one thing that they need is certainty of how the rules apply. So I would say certainty of how this works, who's in, who's out, and how the rules apply is definitely something that, uh, you know, that I would say is, is, is uh, well. Great, thank you. Uh, questions in the audience? We answered everything. Yeah, there's a prayer or something. <laughs> yes? So I have a two-part question. The first will apply to you, just kind of So for my end, as far as the instability, it's interesting. Yeah, I am hearing those concerns, but maybe in a, at least originally in a slightly different way that you kind of laid it out. Um, you know, I obviously have clients that are shut out of this deduction that are contemplating switching over to C Corporation, but the instability that concerns them is not necessarily on 199 Cat Bay side, it's on the C Corp side. How long is that rate really going to be 21%, right? If Democrats take over the White House and the Senate in 2020, is that 21% rate going to jump to 25 or 28? Obviously, these two gentlemen can address that far better than I can. Um, but then the question becomes, then it comes back to your issue, because if the only reason 199 Cap A here is here is to create parity between shareholders and C Corps, if that C Corp rate jumps up to 25 or 28%, what becomes of 199 Cafe? And that's something I couldn't even begin to answer. I'd actually really love to hear their answer in, in that context. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's coming into play because we're in an extremely tenuous tax environment, at least it feels like, and clients certainly sense that. And so I think more, more clients are reluctant to go through that seismic shift uh, to a C corporation just because, again, they're worried how long that rate's really going to be 21%. They're probably focused more on that than whether 199 Cap A is going to be here in the long term. Because I think as long as that corporate rate is 21%, 199 Cap A is going to be here in some shape or form. I think Tony did a great job on that one, so I'll be really brief, and I think he, he answered that pretty well. And, and you know, our HR Block clients, some do have questions. And it, it's broader than just 199A. It's, there were a lot of changes as a result of the TCJA, and so they a lot, had a lot of questions about what's going to change. And then another area that is, is right, really kind of front and center this tax season of, you know, what are these rules going to change is state conformity. So a lot of states are still trying to figure out what's in and what's out as far as the new provisions on the state tax return. So that's certainly an area where taxpayers have questions. And, and with uh, you know, some state legislatures in session, the rules could potentially change mid-season as well. So yeah, I just add, I, I think both Andy and, and, and Tony nailed it with regard to, there's uncertainty on both sides. Um, we have seen a number of our large S corps convert to SC for a variety of reasons, mostly because they have a chance to access that low 21% rate. Um, we did a survey of our membership over last year where I found a remarkable number of S corps who were thinking about converting were holding off because they just didn't believe that that 21% corporate rate was going to be around long term. And to convert, you really needed to be around long term to make it worthwhile. I think one of the issues that sort of mitigates and, and, and is um, allowing people to put off this decision 
um, is the fact that the expensive rolls are around for what the next five years. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you're doing any CapEx and you're able to expense it right off the bat, you probably don't have any taxable income anyway, so you're not paying the 21% rate or the, or the pass-through rate. Um, so I think that's giving, I, I know specifically some of our members, their ability to expense means that they're not, they don't have current tax liabilities, so they can put those decisions off until they feel like there's a, a little more solid uh, uh, policy framework to, to make the decision. Yeah, I, I see uncertainty from two places. One, a, the law itself is you know, legislated as a temporary policy, so you know, the question is whether those things will be made permanent or not. 199 cafes, you know, you know, we don't know. Are they going to make it permanent? Um, but then there's also the other aspect of uncertainty, which is the federal government is projected to run pretty significant budget deficits over the next decade. And that's a big concern for a lot of lawmakers um, in you know, looking at a lot of the tax cuts and jobs act. I mean, TCGA contributed somewhat to that increased deficit. So where are lawmakers going to look to try to bring down the deficit if they do so? Is it going to be the corporate rate? Is it going to be 199 cafe? Any of the in top individual income tax rates? I think all of those things are potential. So. That needs to be weighing on policymakers' minds, on clients' minds. Like things may change, and there are at least two two good reasons for it. Thank you. Um, and with that, we have run out of time. Um, so please, uh, I want to thank you all for coming, and please join me in thanking our panel for a great conversation.